We will uh, start then with House File 3681, which is in the possession of Children and Families Committee um, today as an informational hearing uh, before both bodies. And so Representative Katiza Wittun will invite you to please present your bill and, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, good morning, everyone. I have the privilege to serve on both the Children and Families Policy and Finance Committee as well as the Economic Development um, Committee, and I'm just thrilled that all of my uh, co-committee members um, who are able to join us today are going to be able to uh, consider the proposal that we have spent a lot of time putting together. Um, and you know, this issue, it's a tremendous challenge not only for Minnesota families, but it does have a direct impact on our economy. And in fact, a study that was actually published last February, so now the numbers might be a little bit out of date, um, but it estimates that the U.S. economy loses about $122 billion when parents leave the workforce or even reduce their hours to care for young children. Currently, Minnesota is ranked fourth out of 50 states for the most expensive infant care. In contrast with the average annual cost of college tuition, which is $11,226, or like Chair Hassan mentioned already, housing, about $11,137, infant care in Minnesota costs on average just over $16,000 a year. So last year, uh, Chair Pinto already alluded to some of the work that we've done. The legislature addressed the needs of the lowest income families through investments in childcare assistance, early learning scholarships, Head Start, and school-based pre-K. Our nation-leading child tax credit is going to cut childhood poverty in Minnesota by over one-third. I'm proud of the work that we did for our most vulnerable children, and that work continues. However, we know that there is a huge gap in support for almost 75% of Minnesota families who make too much money to qualify for these existing programs, but not nearly enough to afford both childcare and other necessities. You may be familiar with the federal standard for childcare affordability. We spend a lot of time in the Children and Families Committee talking about that for folks in economic development that might be new for you, but um, the this is a national standard that came down from the Trump administration and also the Biden administration. Um, and last week at our, um, at our bipartisan uh, kickoff at the University of Minnesota, um, one of our uh, speakers, the former CEO of Echolab, um, he mentioned, he said, he said, I don't think that the Trump and Biden administrations have agreed on much, but this statistic is, <laughs> is one of those things. So um, we're, we're using great information here, bipartisan information, and I think we can go forward um, feeling good about that. In Minnesota, the median family with an infant is spending 21% of their annual uh, income. And if that family also has a preschooler, they, it re that reaches 37% of their annualized family income. These huge childcare bills arrive at a time of life when young families are just getting established and often parents are at the start of their earning capacity early in their careers. Since I've started talking more publicly about this issue, I've heard so many stories. Um, do do um, take a look in your packets. There's a lot of information, but we've got a lot of great testifiers to come here and share their stories today as well. But I've heard from people who have made their family planning decisions based on childcare, uh, about people who have dropped out of the workforce and walked away from careers that they love because it just doesn't make sense to work when childcare is so expensive, about families being forced to take whatever care they can get instead of the quality care that they want, and even about one family that lost their home and moved out of state in part because they just missed qualifying for an early learning scholarship. Families in all of our communities across the state are experiencing these difficulties, and we can and must address the child care affordability issue to help every child in Minnesota get off to a great start. House File 3681 builds on the existing and successful early learning scholarship program and the Great Start Task Force recommendations, which are our blueprint for creating a system that works for parents, kids, and our child care workforce. The proposal would help uh, families up to earning up to 150% of the state median income, which is about $174,000 a year for a family of four. Uh, it makes use of our existing providers, including licensed centers, home providers, Head Start programs, public school programs, and also tribally licensed childcare. Provider stability is a hallmark of this bill. And in order to support best our childcare businesses, we have included a number of best practices, um, including um, a couple from North Dakota, um, which uh, include paying prospectively and making sure that our providers have the money that they need for um, running their, their programs ahead of time instead of retroactively having to request and wait on some of these payments. 
Uh, with that, I would, Mr. Chair, like to ha hand it off to Ms. Mock for a more detailed walkthrough of the bill, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion today. Thank you so much, Representative Cateezo. Mr. Attorney, thanks to our House researcher, um, Annie Mock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm Annie Mock with House Research. Uh, and I'm going to walk through House File 3681, which does two primary things. One is to establish the um, Great Start Affordability Scholarship Program, and the other is to establish a data sharing arrangement between the Department of Revenue and the Department of Education. So starting with Section 1, uh, this section, um, so bear with me a minute, I'm going to use the words Great Start a lot. Uh, so last, ses last session, the legislature established a Great Start Scholarship Program that directs the agencies uh, to the state agencies to figure out ways to streamline all the early care and learning programs that the state has for families. And this section would um, provide that the Great Start Affordability Program that's being established under this bill would be included in that streamlining of programs for, um, for children and families in the state. So then Section 2. Uh, uh, establishes the Great Start Affordability Scholarships. So the first, sub sub uh, the first subdivision uh, has that establishment and provides that the purpose is to increase the affordability of high quality early care and learning for families with children from birth to five years old. Subdivision two uh, establishes the family and child el eligibility for the scholarships. So uh, a family is eligible for the program if the family has income less than 150% of state median income and has a at least one child who is under the age of five years old and is not concurrently receiving childcare assistance or an early learning scholarship. Subdivision three establishes program eligibility, so childcare and early education programs um, and their eligibility for the program. And they can participate or accept a child with a scholarship um, as long as they are participating in the state's quality rating and improvement system or parent aware. Subdivision four has administrative direction for MDE. So it directs the department to establish application timelines and procedures. Uh, it provides that the scholarships are awarded for a 12 month period and requires a family to renew a scholarship prior to the end of an award, per award period. And then it also directs the department to establish a process that a family can use to um, request a modification and scholarship amount um, prior to the end of the renewal, end of the award period, um, if the family um, needs a modification due to uh, varying circumstances. And then this subdivision also specifies <coughs> circumstances when the department has to cancel a scholarship. Subdivision five. Uh, uh, directs, the age, or directs MDE on the scholarship amounts, and it provides that the department has to establish a monthly scholarship amount based on family income with a minimum per child amount of $25 per month. And then subdivision six uh, directs MDE to establish a system for making uh, scholarship payments to programs, and that system has to have a number of, um, of characteristics in place that include um, having a written agreement between a program and a family that identifies the scholarship as a state-provided benefit. Uh, the, the system must pay prospectively. Uh, the system must make payments based on a child's enrollment rather than a child's attendance. And there has to be a process in place for transferring scholarships between early care and learning programs when a scholarship recipient uh, moves programs. Uh, this uh, subdivision also requires that the payments under this program start no later than September 1st of 2024. Subdivision 7 has two family notifications. Uh, one is that the department notify families in the state about potential eligibility for the program. Uh, and the second is that um, the early care and learning programs that accept scholarships have to identify as state provided assistance the portion of the scholarship, um, uh, the portion of a, a recipient's tuition that is paid for by the scholarship on each billing statement. Subdivision 8 creates a Great Start Affordability Scholarship account. Um, this is an account in the Special Revenue Fund, uh, and it allows the department to use up to 7% of annual appropriations for costs associated with administering and monitoring the scholarships. And that includes making payments to early care and learning programs um, for their administrative costs uh, associated with accepting the scholarships. So moving on to Section 3, uh, this adds a new subdivision to um, uh, to statute that um, allows the Commissioner of Revenue to disclose to the Commissioner of Education 
uh, the minimum tax return information necessary to verify an individual's income for purposes of determining the individual's eligibility for early care and learning programs administered by MDE. Uh, sections four and five, both of these sections um, transfer, they, uh, section four transfers the scholarship program, section five transfers those, that data sharing responsibility to the new Department of Children, Youth, and Families once it's operational. So these would both be under this bill, both of these would, uh, the administrative authority would move. And then section six is the appropriation to MDE for the, um, the affordability scholarships. Um, it is a blank appropriation that starts in fiscal year 2024 and is ongoing. <coughs> and this appropriation also would transfer to the new department once it is operational. <coughs> that is the bill. Thank you, Ms. Mock. So members, um, since we just went through the bill, if there are clarifying questions just about the mechanics of what uh, Ms. Mock uh, read or what's in the bill, I think that's okay to do that, but I know there'll be a, a broader discussion about the bill a little later, but just in case anybody has anything. Okay. I'm not sure what the mic issue is. And um, Ms. Mock had said that reading the bill um, sort of forces you to use the phrase great start a lot, which folks who know me will know that I'm really happy about. Um, so <laughs> use it as many times as anybody wants. That's great. Um, so uh, Representative Katiza Wittoon, are we ready for um, to move to testifiers? Mr. Chair, I think that would be a, a great next step. I did want to um, really quickly acknowledge um, the folks who are here for the Minnesota Child Care Association Day on the Hill. Um, so hopefully many of you will be meeting with providers from your districts later on today. Um, but their Day on the Hill events kick off over at the Capitol building um, in just under 15 minutes. So I know some of them will have to take off before we are done today, and but I appreciate you being here. I appreciate all uh, the folks who are here to listen into the testimony. Thank you, Representative Katiz Wittun. Yes, many thanks to those who do this incredible work of getting our kids off to a great start. Appreciate it. So our first testifier, maybe we'll have the first uh, couple come up if we can, um, Karina Vieda and Cheryl Thomas. And uh, once, um, Karina Vieda, once you settle in, if you can uh, identify yourself. I'm gonna have to say, um, we are tight on time of quite a few testifiers. So I'm gonna be pretty strict about um, two minutes per testifier. So I will at, sort of at the two minute mark have to unfortunately cut you off. I'm gonna apologize in advance for that just to make sure that we keep, keep on moving. So please identify yourself um, uh, and please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Pinto, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Karina Vleda. I'm a mother, a student, an advocate, a future lawyer, and I'm delighted to share my story with y'all. A number of women motivated me to be here today. I'm here for the mothers across Minnesota who deserve better. I'm here for my mom who taught me the value of hard work and who has provided me with affordable childcare for the last three years. I'm here for my daughter, Luna, who deserves a better future and more time with a mom who is less stressed. Minnesota is failing families. We're trapped in a broken cycle. We need education to secure a better future for ourselves and our children, but we need childcare in order to go to school and to go to work. And we need to work full time to just afford this expensive child care. Um, and the cycle continues. We expect mothers to do the impossible, to attend school full time, work full time, raise a family full time as, we're not, as if we're not bound with the same 24 hours a day everyone else is. My mother taught me that through hard work, sacrifice, you can achieve your goals. She was a Salvadorian immigrant who didn't speak English, yet managed to open a thriving grocery store. She worked around the clock to provide me and my siblings with a better life. Today, she continues to support me by taking care of my daughter. It is the only way I'm able to make ends meet, even with the support here. There are moments where I just live paycheck to paycheck. The pace I have kept since the birth of my daughter is, in a word, unsustainable. I wake up at 6 a.m., feed my daughter, pump breast milk, get her ready for the day, pack my lunch, dinner. From 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., I work as a stockbroker's assistant where I get only 15 minutes of break just for pumping and eating and a quick call to check on Luna. Um, I'm home by 7.30, I feed my daughter, I spend half an hour with her, and then she goes to bed. Um, and then at 8 p.m., it's time to do some schoolwork. I usually study until 1 a.m., and then I cross my fingers that Luna sleeps throughout the night so I can get my work done. Um, and then the next day, I wake up at 6 a.m., and I do it all over again. At one point, the stress of this relentless pace, um, you know, wounded me up at the ER, and the doctor told me I need to stress less. I need to take a vacation. Um, and that's like telling me to fly to the moon. 
Um, there are resources out there, institutions that have stepped in to close this gap where policy has fallen short. However, the resources that exist are insufficient. For example, at the University of Minnesota, yeah, sorry, we'll have to cut you off moment. There is a here, child care assistant program uh, to support parenting students. However, there's not enough funds to meet the demand. I've applied for multiple university, state, federal child care assistant programs only to wait seven months to be told I'm denied um, or there's no longer any funds. Research clearly illustrates that the benefits of strong early learning can I have is to, important. Yeah, I'm going to have to have you wrap up. I'm so sorry. No, you're Quite good. a bit over. Yeah, but and thank you. Thank you so much It'll for your testimony. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for your work, and best of luck in your legal studies, especially, and everything else. Thank you. So um, Cheryl Thomas is up next, and, and once, as you settle in, um, Dalton Outlaw, if you can make your way up as well and just be awaiting, that'll sort of save us a little bit of time. And once you get settled in, please identify yourself. Um, and please proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Cheryl Thomas and I operate C's Daycare. I am the second largest child care in the Red Lake Nation. I do have assistants who I do employ. Um, I am also a mother, a foster parent, a grandmother, and I have also run for tribal council. I am a very, res I'm very respected in my community as an advocate who is also um, the person, the go-to person when somebody needs answers or help or a helping hand. I'm a voice for the children and the families in my community. I care very much about my community, our families, and the services I provide. I earned a four-star rating in the Parent Aware, and I've worked with First Children's Finance to support <coughs> renovations and improvements in my program. I work to ensure our children learn and are supported by Ojibwe language and culture. I also work tirelessly to manage the state child care assistance program, the federal child care development fund resources for tribal families and early learning scholarships. Because of those resources and the trust of the families I serve, I am proud to say we never closed during COVID. During COVID, my kids had perfect attendance. I'm, I almost <laughs> cried as I was so proud of them and us. So many people say this work is just daycare. I think kids just come, they think just, kids just come and play and nap and are kept safe and that's all I do. So many people say I work this daycare, oh, they don't see the weekends and nights where I spend most of my time working on licensing, on funding for families, or trainings on weekends and preparing lessons. They also don't see me traveling, you know, miles to find the best prices for products because of the inflation. Um, I get supplies uh, for food and for the week so that we can operate and we don't have to leave childcare. Um, this uh, last weekend, I was at a birthday party and this is just an example of me working on weekends. And I will have to have you wrap up a moment oh, <laughs> just, okay. in just the next couple seconds here. I'm okay. so sorry, yeah. Um, I don't need recognition. I do it because I love these children, but love is not enough to get the people everything they need. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I am so sorry. Yeah, having eight, pe having eight people in the time we have is maybe a little crazy. So we're, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for your testimony and your work. And um, uh, as you settle in, uh, as Del Notla does, Ifra and Nur, if you can please make your way up as well. And so sorry for the timing constraints here. Um, but please, uh, uh, if you can identify yourself and proceed. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dalton Outlaw. I am a social entrepreneur and developer founder and CEO of Element Gym, and founder and president of Outlaw Development, an affordable housing developer here in St. Paul. Together with my wife, Lacey, we raise, are raising five boys, ages between one and nine years old, Dalton Jr., Liam, Isaac, Mason, and Roman, whose first birthday is today. Hey, happy birthday. <laughs> uh, I'm joining you today to express my support of House File 3681. My support to the bill is tied back to my role as a father, employer, and housing developer. As someone raising a big family, I know how expensive childcare and preschool are and how this shapes the family's decisions on a day-to-day. -day. I also know how important quality childcare is to fast developing brains of young children. As an employer and entrepreneur, I know that the lack of quality of affordable housing, uh, affordable childcare is a drag on the economy. Keeping people out of the workforce or causing people not to work more hours or to decline raises in order to qualify for existing subsidy programs. As a provider of affordable housing, I know that high cost of childcare can dramatically impact families' budgets 
interfering with their ability to afford stable housing and causing them to have to choose between paying their rent and utilities and their child care bills. Thank you for listening to my considering words and uh, my support to 3681. Thank you so much. Thanks for the testimony. And again, happy birthday to your son. Thank you. One year, yeah. Uh, so Ifra Nur, as you settle in, uh, Elena Skogland uh, actually is on video, I think. So we're going to see what we can do. Maybe Joel West Westendorp, you can make your way up as well and be ready to testify. All right, Mr. Chair, I'm going to try to. Oh, uh, yeah, you maybe see what you can do on set up the video. And um, Ifra Nur, ple pleasure to have you. And please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chair Pinto and members of the committee. My name is Ifra Noor and I am a director at South Metro Child Care Academy in Bloomington. I am also a leader at Kids Count on Us. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, at South Metro Child Care Academy, we're open seven days a week, um, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekdays, and we're also open 12 to 9 on the weekend. We have three shifts during those seven days. And even though you know we're surging for families in need, we are not full, which makes it difficult for us to make ends meet. We only have seven toddlers enrolled, and I have a preschool room and a school-age room that are closed. Only one of our three shifts is fully enrolled. Every day I hear stories from families that make it clear we're not fu fully enrolled because child care <coughs> because child care and early learning is not affordable for families. Too many families do not qualify for child care assistance, but do not make enough money to pay for child care. For many, this means one parent must often stay home and not work, which is always the mother. Um, I personally had to leave my job at the school because I couldn't afford child care. Um, now I work at the child care where my kids come and I get it for discounted price. Um, and I'm fortunate to have that opportunity. I help families also apply for child care benefits every day, and I see mothers that get denied because they're over the limit. Um, I had one mom that was very upset because she was $3 over the limit um, to get child, child care assistance. As a child care provider, I am offering a services that almost no one can pay for, but I cannot afford to charge any less and stay open. Yet our communities cannot function without a child care. Parents cannot go to work without a child care, and child care centers cannot stay open without the children. Um, the bill HF3681 supports families by lowering their child care costs, but also supports child care centers and the entire child care system by ensuring that we have the resources we need to remain open and continue to edu educate young children. I urge you to support it, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thanks for your important work for our kids and for being here. Members and Katiza, as Joe Westendorp, as you settle in, um, oh, look at that. We do have, actually, it's, it's working. At least we have the video. Well, hopefully the audio works, too. So um, the, this next testifier is going to be by video, Elena Skoglund, um, who I think will probably identify herself. And so, Representative Katiza, we'll see if we can make it work. Oh. Okay, we've got video, not audio yet. Maybe somebody can. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna see what we can do. As you're working on, uh, yeah. No, wait. I'm a young son and a child care teacher and a leader with kids count on us. Yeah, why don't you once you restart, Rosa? If you're able to, this is a recording. I should just note for folks, as opposed to being live. It's a recording. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Good morning, Chair Pinto and members of both committees. My name is Elena Skoglin. I am the parent of a young son and a child care teacher and a leader with Kids Count on Us. I appreciate the opportunity to share my story with you today. I am a full-time teacher at the Early Education Center at Minnesota State Moorhead, where I teach three and four-year-olds. My son, Harvey, is in the toddler room just down the hall from me. My husband works full-time as a police officer in the city of Holly. My husband and I always wanted to have children close in age. But Harvey is now two and a half years old, and we're not even considering a second child at the moment. I'm not exaggerating when I say that the cost of child care is the number one factor. At the upper end of the pay scale for child care teachers, I still only make $19.27 an hour. Even with state funding, teacher wages are still largely dependent on what families can afford to pay. And families are paying much more than they can afford. Our child care costs for just one child eat up 50% of my annual income. If we were to have a second child, my entire salary would go to pay for child care. We're not an outlier. However, we are the norm. Well, I'm, 
I'm grateful that assistance exists to help families with the lowest incomes. What about the rest of us who make too much to qualify but not enough to live comfortably? Doing everything right, getting a college degree, being in a stable marriage, doing a job that helps my community is no longer enough to scrape by. Mm -hmm. We are two full-time working parents working in careers that are vital to the thriving community. And we can barely afford to support one child. We need teachers and we need police officers. And for us and others to do these jobs well, we need and deserve high quality childcare that is affordable. And as a college educated childcare teacher, I deserve to earn much more than $19.27 an hour. Mm -hmm. HF3681 will provide funding to reduce childcare costs significantly for so many Minnesota families like mine. I urge you to support this bill and make it possible for families to afford their lives. Thank you. And would folks please thank. Good morning, uh, Chair Pinto. Oh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> folks, please thank uh, Elena Skoglund uh, for the testimony and both to her and to her and her husband for their for their work. And thanks to those of you. And if folks do need to leave. For, certainly, feel free to. That's that's like we do understand that you're moving on to other things in your day, but so grateful for your work as uh, providers of childcare and early learning. We appreciate it. So um, Joe West, Westendorp is up next, and then Leon Rasashak, uh, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, uh, if you can make your way up. But please uh, proceed with your testimony and identify yourself and go. Cool. Thanks. Chairs Pinto and Hassan and members of the committee. Hello, my name is Jill Westendorp, and I'm speaking as part of Take Action Minnesota's Parents and Caregivers United, organizing so Minnesotan families have what they need. Thank you for hearing me. I urge you to support the Great Start Affordability Program <clears throat> and fully fund childcare for every infant and young child in Minnesota. The high cost of childcare impacts virtually all Minnesota parents. Most families pay too much of their income to ensure their children have joyful, enriching care environments that support their development. This economic burden causes enormous stress, which negatively impacts parents' ability to be present, patient, and engaged with their children. The lack of affordable childcare also has an enormous economic impact on our state. Parents often have to choose between paying more than they can afford for childcare or quitting their jobs to care for their children. Both are bad for the economy due to reduced consumer spending and a smaller workforce. For my own family, quitting my job made the most sense. My husband was working from home full time while caring for our infant while I was at work. This was untenable, and so when my daughter Ramona was eight months old, I left my career to become a 24-7 caregiver. My husband took on more work to make up for my lost income, often working up to 90 hours a week to provide for our family. We were both perpetually stressed and exhausted. It was not ideal for my husband, for me, or for our daughter. Access to affordable childcare would have made our life look completely different. I would have been able to continue my career. My husband would not have had to work so much, and we both would have been less stressed and more present with our daughter. Research shows that the first four years of life are the most critical time for social, emotional, and cognitive development. I urge you to honor the, the research and the stories of families like mine and fully fund the Great Start Affordability Program. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for sharing your experience and helping helping others as well. Um, Leah Rastachak, you're making your way up. And then uh, Suzanne Temple, um, I believe, is a public testifier. And if you can make your way up. And welcome. And please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chair Hassan, Chair Pinto, and members. My name is Leanne Rastachak. My pronouns are she, her. I am biological and bonus mom to four children, ages 3 through 11. I am also CEO of Women Venture. For the past 45 years, Women Venture's mission has been to empower women to achieve their economic goals by building profitable and sustainable businesses that transform our communities in Minnesota. Women Venture is expanding efforts to sustain, to sustain the supply of child care providers in Minnesota by giving clients the tools, skills, and capital to run these profitable and sustainable businesses. We are grateful for the 2023 state appropriation and have deployed nearly $250,000 in grants and loans to help child care businesses in nine counties thus far and counting since signing the agreement with DEED in November. Child care is a uniquely important and challenging industry. Despite the importance of this industry, many challenges and obstacles to starting and sustaining child care businesses remain, and the supply of child care uh, providers continues to decline. Minnesota has lost more than 250 licensed providers in the past year. 
While we're working on the supply side of the problem and are really happy to partner with the state in doing so, the reality is that these, in their current state, are often unsustainable or very low profit margin businesses. And so in addition to working on the supply side, we also need to work on the demand side by increasing public investment in the support of families as HF 3681 does. By increasing support for families, we are also increasing support for retaining childcare businesses in Minnesota, of which there are less than 8,000. The current population of children ages zero to four in Minnesota, accord according to Wilder Research, is more than 330,000. The math doesn't math. Personally, as my partner and I plan for childcare this summer for four, our four, four children, the cost for quality affordable summer care will exceed our monthly mortgage. I feel the strain and challenge of balancing childcare costs, student debt, and home ownership. And, I, and we are speaking from a privileged uh, position as a dual high income household. I'm advocating as a mother, employer, and leader who wants to see better options for all of our children in a diverse workforce of all income levels. The lack of quality affordable childcare is keeping parents, primarily mothers, who want to work out of the workforce and deepening our state's workforce shortage. Only as, to have you wrap up momentarily, sorry. <laughs> as employers pressure employees back to the office, it is nearly impossible to be successful at home and at work without reliable, accessible child care. Today, I share this deeply personal story and experience with you because I support public investment in HF 3681. Thank you for your time, consideration, and service. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your, sharing your experience and also your leadership via Women Venture. We're grateful. And so our final two testifiers, I think, are members of the public who'd signed up. I'll ask you to be kind of even more tight, I'm afraid, on time. Um, but the first is Suzanne temple -Gum, and then our final testifier, if you can be up, uh, make your way up as well. Um, please identify yourself and proceed. Hi, I'm Suzanne temple -Gum. I've been a high school teacher for 17 years. My spouse works at a Fortune 1000 company. We're parents to two, Ben, who's almost four, and Charlie, who's two. I'm also pregnant. Our family lives in a small house in West St. Paul. We spend sensibly and do our best to avoid new debt. Despite this, my spouse has to work a second job so we can pay the bills and save. With two in daycare, the cost of childcare is currently about three times the cost of our mortgage. Come September, we'll have three children in daycare. On the heels of unpaid maternity leave, my spouse and I will be paying $45,384 a year on childcare nearly 30% of our net income. Our monthly daycare costs will be more than the cost of our groceries, car payments, utilities, student loans, and mortgage combined. The astronomical price tag isn't the only stumbling block. Finding infant care for the new baby has been substantially more time consuming and frustrating than it was in 2019. We contacted 21 home daycares and seven centers. Nine of the home daycares didn't respond. Others didn't have an open infant spot for two years. Of those centers that had openings, one was $485 a week, another $2,200 a month. One center with a potential opening in May of 2025 said we could be put on their waiting list for a non-refundable $422. Mm -hmm. The center where, center where our sons went currently has 13 infants in line before ours. In desperation, we have actually considered asking my in-laws if they would move to Minnesota to help with childcare the monthly cost of a rental for them would be less than the cost of many centers. Mm -hmm. As things currently stand, with my spouse working an extra job, I often come home from teaching all day to solo parenting two toddlers while pregnant. It's hard, we're exhausted, and I do not believe that it should be this hard for a family to make ends meet when both parents are college educated and working more than full time. As a parent and fellow Minnesotan, I ask for solutions to the current childcare crisis in our state. If not for my family, then for others to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your experience um, to help others. And then our final testifier, if you can make your way on up. And, uh, and identify yourself and please proceed. Good morning. Uh, my name is Margaret Sitta. You might not be surprised to see me here, Representative Pinto. I've talked to you about this out in the community. You have. Um, I'm a high school counselor and parent, and I'm here to testify in support of House File 3681. I currently have two children in daycare, a preschooler and an infant. And this school year, my family is spending $896 per week for child care. As an educator, that is my entire paycheck. Child care is far and away our largest household expense. And because, but because I carry benefits for our family and I get a break in the summer, we're very slightly ahead financially for me to continue working. I also like my job. My work is fulfilling, challenging, and interesting. And while it's difficult to be both a parent of young children and an employee, I would personally not prefer being a state 
stay-at-home parent. My children are learning things I would not be able to teach them at home, and they love their teachers. I want every child to be able to access the kind of quality care that my children do. I'm deeply grateful for my kids' child care providers and the hard work they do, and I know they are not paid enough for the value they provide our family and our society. The economics of essential care work don't work for providers or families. For example, when my family was looking for infant care, no other child care providers in our area had a space available, even with 11 months of notice. Both cost and access have been an issue for us, and I know our now beloved center is doing their best not to increase costs for families while still providing quality care. We need the state to step in to support parents who are squeezed financially early in their careers and daycare providers who need to keep their so, keep their doors open. I urge your support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any other member of the, test, uh, of the public who wishes to testify? Um, Okay, there we go. So that's good. So um, we're going to move on to then to discussion on the bill. Um, and uh, Representative Coulter, I think, had signed up or had, had uh, raised his hand earlier. Representative Coulter, we'll start with you. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and first of all, I want to thank Representative Hughes-Wittoon <coughs> for her advocacy and passion on this uh, on this issue. And I want to thank Chair Hassan as well for her comments because I, I think it really is important not only to hear the stories from Minnesotans on that side of the table, but to hear the stories from Minnesotans on this side of the table too. Um, I also uh, want to give a shout out to Ifra, who offered a, a center in my district and uh, sent me some lovely Valentines last week. Um, now I'm wearing a, a button today that says, I'm at work today because I have childcare. And that is literally true for me every day, um, but it was acutely true for me this week because 48 hours ago, almost exactly, I got a panic text from my wife because our childcare arrangements had fallen through for yesterday. And we were able to, to make other arrangements in it and it worked out. But we know that that's not true for a lot of folks out there. And I, I just wonder, you know, how many others in this room can say that? How many others outside of this room wish they could say that? You know, I was at uh, the, the school where my daughter goes to preschool a couple of months ago and if we think this is not something that Minnesotans talk about, I guarantee you they do. There were, I, I heard two moms, and I, I, it was difficult to resist jumping in and telling them what I do for my day job, um, but two moms literally just talking about how challenging it is to find childcare, how expensive it is, and all of the, the hoops that they have to jump through just to make things work as parents of young kids. And the fact is that we all interact with the child care system, whether or not we have young kids. And this crisis is holding all of us back. Child care costs are holding us all back in so many different ways. We know, of course, um, the ways it's, it's holding back businesses and workers, but it's holding us back on family and community stability, on our ability to do the things that make life worth living, be parents and, and friends and, and active and engaged members of our community. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see this move forward for that reason alone. Um, but the other point that I want to make, and this is my last one, I promise, because I know we have a very full agenda. We do. Um, and those of you who, who closely follow the property tax division, as I know so many of us do, heard me <laughs> make this point yesterday that really this is a case of pay me now or pay me later. We can invest in quality, affordable, accessible early care and education now, or we can put more money later into public assistance programs, into housing, into health care, into the, the criminal justice and correction system, as, as Chair Pinto knows. Pay me later is always more expensive. It's always harder on our communities, and it always leads to worse outcomes. So I'm excited to see this move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Coulter. Representative Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Katiza Watoon, for bringing this bill forward and initiating a conversation that's obviously of great importance um, to many folks here in Minnesota. I think this process works best um, when we're able to, from across the aisle, kind of illuminate each other's blind spots. I know you guys in the majority have definitely done that for me over the course of the past year, um, and I hope to return the favor perhaps a little bit here in, in these comments. Um, so, you know, there are multiple blind spots that I detect in the proposal that's before us today, but I'll focus just on two for the sake of time. 
Um, the first is long-term fiscal sustainability. Um, you know, we had, many of us were present at the U uh, last Tuesday when we heard a symposium and panels um, hosted by the leadership of all of our caucuses on this issue of uh, early uh, child learning and child care. And it struck me as a fantastic sales presentation offering all of the features and benefits of what this proposal could provide for the people of Minnesota. But there was one crucial piece missing that would be present in any actual sales presentation, and that's the price. What does it cost? What am I gonna have to give up in order to obtain these features and benefits? And that's reflected in this bill where of course we have the, the blank spaces where appropriations would go. Um, and so the question becomes not just how much this is gonna cost us now, but to what extent we're gonna be able to maintain such a system moving forward. And you know, those are questions that definitely need to be answered because when we hear all of these stories that we can all relate to of having to contend with the affordability of a crucial service that our families depend on, by doing this, we are not removing those costs, we're simply transferring them. We're, we're transferring them to the entire state, which is fine if the state can afford it, and if the state can afford it not just today, but tomorrow and 10 years from now and 100 years from now. And so I think what I would encourage the majority to do is to try to put some thought and actually put some numbers on what this looks like generationally going forward. Like, do we have the capacity not just to kickstart it today, <coughs> uh, but to ensure that we'll be able to keep promises that we're making to people moving forward? And w one of the things I would point to is, you know, frequently, and maybe we'll hear it later when we get into presentations, we hear um, claims of future return on investment. We had great economic conversations last year about uh, where money comes from and what we can expect in the future. So, you know, if those, predictions are true, that we can expect some sort of return on investment in the future, we should be able to quantify at what point can we expect reductions in other areas of the state budget as a direct result of the investments that we're making today. Um, and so I would definitely encourage uh, the majority to look at that. And just one more quick point, yeah. you know, I, I feel as though we might be evading accountability for the impact that public policy has had on the economy and the extent to which that is providing the downward pressure that folks are feeling manifest as difficulty with childcare. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking, Representative Katizuitun, <clears throat> that we've got a couple other folks, and then maybe we'll have until uh, I, I suspect you'll probably want to make some comments in response to that, but maybe we'll move on to a couple other testifiers and they'll let you make comments at the end if that's okay. And I suppose because Representative Hudson was kind of the one who framed that up, if that's okay with him, because he may want to have, okay, we'll do that. He seems nodding. So, Representative Eliza Carr, we'll go to you next then. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative, for bringing this bill. I think we all agree a great start is critical. I sit on three committees, health care and uh, workforce and, and children and family. And I certainly wouldn't have worked for 40 years uh, without having a child care in the last 30 years of my life. With that said, I think it's really a, in critical that we have family child care center freestanding child care and school-based pre-care program, that this triangle is strong in all the communities of the state. And one of the things that concerns me is when we had our hearing in November, First Family Finance testified that 1,300 providers are concerned that they financially won't exist because they lose money on infants, they break even on toddlers, and they start to make money on preschoolers. So. With that happening, we elevated one thing, which was great, an, a pre-K pre program, but we have two other major legs on that triangle that are possibly going to implode in Minnesota. So if that implodes with creating this great start of allowing benefits, we don't have providers because they can't, they can't financially make it. So I hope that we're looking at this model in a broad base of what we're doing to assure that the infants and the toddlers are gonna to have a, a provider base that's, that's sustainable in the sense of uh, what we do. The other, the other piece I would say is that uh, there's no doubt that mandates cost money. And if you look at what happened in the nursing home industry, we, we regulated it and then we created an assisted living model. And we now have regulated that to match nursing homes and we're in the same boat. The cost of one up 
and models have closed, and then we're in the same boat. I would encourage us as child care providers to look at what are we doing with teacher uh, licensing and, and how are we using people. We, we went against the four-year degree for the government jobs to allow to look at who, who is this person and what are their opportunities. And so to not look at those pieces too, I think is gonna be detrimental to our whole big picture to create a plan that's going to work in, in rural Minnesota, greater Minnesota, and the suburbs in Minneapolis, St. Paul, because it matters to all of us. And when I look at the data in the district I represent, we've lost 50% of home care providers in Proctor, Two Harbors, Duluth, Hermantown, 50% is a huge hit. So healthcare workers, we we built Mecca hospitals and we have, you know, you, you don't know if you come to work and you're there on your shift, but somebody doesn't come in because for whatever reason, you're gonna be working a double shift. And mostly it's family child care centers that are able to accommodate that. No notice, because you don't know until it's 1.45 p.m. and somebody didn't show up for the two o'clock shift and you're you're now working 16 hours. So Family child care is really critical for these manufacturing jobs in our economy and health care. So to the point of making sure the triangle's strong to the great start, I hope we can work together to look at those initiatives of how we do that. And I think there are opportunities for us to move forward. The 7% is, I understand what the, what the ask is. I mean, I understand how, how expensive child care is. And so I do think there's ways we can move this needle and the cliff for people you know, to be $3 over is disappointing. That is something we should have been working on for decades of looking at what is this gradual cliff uh, for eligibility in lots of things. We've, we have this all or none mentality and there could be a, a better way to the state for, to support what we're trying to do. But my, my suggestion is, is that we need to look at the mandates as well as looking at at money that people pay because they are directly related. And if the provider doesn't exist, it doesn't matter how much of my income I'm gonna pay because the provider still has to make it with the mandates that exist today. So I appreciate what you're doing. I understand the ask and the intent, the points made on the fiscal note, I haven't seen that yet. But the reality is we've been told there's, there's no money and the majority party has said in the tax committee, we don't want any new taxes. Uh, so we need to figure out a plan of how is Minnesotans going to afford this? What, what, do, what bucket do we take from to make something like this work? And then what do we do to make it reasonable? For th something that will work for greater Minnesota, rural Minnesota, suburbs, metro. And that's what's going to make one Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a time check for folks. Um, I think we'll want to move on to the next, to the presentations at, by, by like 9.30. So that's to just sort of keep an eye on time. Um, but uh, Representative uh, Weiner, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess when it comes to family and, and issues like that, maybe I have a unique perspective on things. Most of the people in this committee probably realize or know that as a father of nine and one of my child children here with me today, I uh, have a big investment in family. And it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I love seeing when legislators bring their children onto the floor. I mean, th this is great. That offers us some flexibility. Um, but when I look at things like this, I question the why. Why are we in the position where we are? So Minnesota has the sixth highest cost for daycare in the nation. In a recent article, Minnesota Reformer, one of the major reasons that the cost of daycare is so high is regulations. So out in greater Minnesota, what we see is at-home daycare was huge. You know, if you had a working, uh, mother that wanted to pick up something on the side, they would do daycare in their home. The flexibility was there. What's happened with overregulation has driven those daycares out of existence. So it, it was brought up in many different articles. If you, if you just scroll down why we're in the position we are, overregulation has killed us. It was mentioned that 50% down as far as number of daycares. So we have this shortage in greater Minnesota based on a situation that was created by legislation. Now we want good, safe daycares, obviously, but when we're driving them out of business because of regulation that's been put into place, and then we have to come up with another solution. Maybe we need to look back at that regulation and, and, and really analyze 
if that has been effective and if it needs to keep going on. The other thing is when it comes to um, cost and affordability. There was just something on the radio I listened to this morning and I thought it was great. They said about uh, 25, 30 years ago, roughly 20% of your income was eaten up by taxes. We're in a position now where 40 to 45% of your income is taken up by taxes. Now we are a high tax state. So put that into perspective, medium income in Minnesota is $83,000. That 20% increase is about $16,000. Can we afford daycare if we lower our taxes in the state? If we look at how we're providing services, and I believe the governor had said we're a high tax but high service, here we are over-regulating, over-taxing, and creating problems that do not allow our families to look at the options and say, we want to have more children. With a negative birth rate in our country, we absolutely need to have more families. I'm a big supporter of that. But if we're creating a situation through legislation and taxes that makes it cost prohibitive, regulation prohibitive, we really need to analyze what we have done here. A little bit of self you know, introspection here. And if bad legislation has put us in this position, we need to look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Wiener. I may just, um, Representative Kateser, to just the point of a regulation. I think it's true, isn't it, that like th throughout the country, red states, blue states, whatever the regulatory scheme, this is a huge crisis every, in every state, no matter how red it is, no matter what their system is. Um, you know, we could have 10 in infants per, per, per caregiver. Um, that would loosen regulations. Nobody would want to have their kid at that place, and it'd be extremely dangerous. But just any thoughts about, about that point? Because um, I think it is something that we often hear about the crisis, as opposed to just recognizing that the economics just don't work, just like they wouldn't in K-12 if we were expected that to be for profit. But any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I've said um, often um, you know, in, in presentations and discussion in this committee over the last five years that um, you know, if, you, if you look, you just have to look across the St. Croix um, to Wisconsin, and we have we have similar population. We have um, you know similar uh, demographics, for the most part. Um, wildly different regulatory climate when it comes to childcare, in particular. And Wisconsin and other states across the nation are seeing the same decline, particularly with family childcare providers. I mean, I think that we have to consider the fact that if somebody's providing childcare in their home, um, I think. Many parents do that while their children are young, um, and so that they have that flexibility that Representative Weiner talked about, um, so they're able to spend that time with their children and still make a little bit of income for their family um, uh, while while being able to be home. And then when their children go to school, they may or may not want to keep providing that. Then you have to look at somebody who provides that care for five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years. I have four children myself. And, um, and I can't thank the, the child care providers who have helped to care and educate for my children um, enough because that is, it's exhausting enough being a parent um, and, and spending the, the, you know, whatever your work schedule allows for you to be able to spend with your children. And most of us would really love to spend more. Um, but it's, it's exhausting when you're not getting paid for it and it's exhausting when you're even getting paid for it. So as people reach retirement age, we really have to think, you know, is that the reason that they might be leaving the, the market because they have dedicated their entire career to serving the children and families of their community and it's just time to move on um, and, and enjoy their retirement years? Or are they gonna re-enter the workforce because their children are now in the public school system or um, a, a different school system that allows them to return to the career that they had left previously? Thank you. Yeah, and so we we do need to wrap up. I know to be able to move on to the presentations. Um, Lee Daniels, off on our committee, has a final thought or word that he wants to provide. Don't know if that's if that's the case. Lee Daniels. Of course, the bill will be back up before us. But Lee Daniels. Uh, thank you, Chair Pinto. Um, well, I couldn't say it probably better than my colleagues have said it. Uh, the one question I have is is um, if we are going to make sure that nobody pays more than seven seven percent for for daycare, up to $188,000 for a family of four. And the, the daycare centers are knowing that they're getting, you know, basically daycare subsidized. Wouldn't it be a huge, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a bad thing or a good thing, but 
the rates are going to go up exponentially. So I think uh, Representative Weiner hit the nail on the head about looking at the long term. Are we going to be able to afford this? And I remember asking in committee last year of all the spending that took place. When we get into the red, what programs are we willing to cut? So I agree fully with that. I just, huh. uh, we don't want to go over our skis. Um, and I just don't know if, if, if anything's been thought of, if the rates are going to be raised, which is not a bad thing that people can, daycare providers can provide decent wages for their workers, but is there any limits? Is a percentage we want to look at or a cap per year we want to look at? Because if we can't control that, then the cost to the state is just going to skyrocket. And just like basically proceed with caution. Let's get some thought put into that. But um, it's it's a big problem. I uh, I've told my story many times where my wife had to quit her pair position at the kindergarten center to stay home and watch our kids. So I, we know what the struggles can be. But um, yeah, it's going it, it could be really really expensive for the state. Thank you, Lee Daniels. Um, so uh, sorry to do this to the author, but I'll ask you to keep it real short if you can as you summarize to, so we can move on. Representative Tease with you. Mr. Chair, I, um, I really appreciate everyone's comments today, um, particularly our, our minority members. I think that there is a lot um, uh, that we need to consider in, in moving forward. And I, so I appreciate the chairs. Um, bringing us together early on in the session so that we have time to, to do some of that um, conversation and, and, and due diligence. Um, we'll continue working with our um, advocates and, and providers. I know um, in particular when it comes to regulation, um, most child care providers don't want to see us uh, look at that, um, that ratio count um, simply because it would be really challenging and difficult and <clears throat> unsafe eventually um, to have too many children um, under one roof um, when it comes to either a center or um, family-based child care. And I think um, but looking at the future costs and the return on investment, where we can shift some of those levers um, in terms of what we are having to pay for already and what we can maybe uh, make an impact on early in life and, and see, see those returns down the road. So I appreciate the consideration. Well, thank you so much for such an exciting proposal. And we know that there's such a need uh, all around the state as we have this. Um, this is a public good. It needs public support. So thank you so much, Representative Tees Batum. Look forward to having the bill back before the Children and Families Committee. And so grateful to our colleagues on both committees for the conversation.